I want to show you guys a picture real quick uh, and just ask you kind of what comes to your mind when you see this certain bubble that many of you are familiar with. It is a bubble in which you see often. It is a bubble which you see maybe daily. No, it's not bubbles from blowing bubbles. Anybody still blow bubbles? Okay, good. Don't blow bubbles. That's weird. <laughs> just kidding. Unless you got daughters. John has daughters. That's cool. Uh, but what about this bubble right here? What do you think of when you see that bubble right there? Hmm? Texting? Did somebody say texting? What else? What else y'all think of when you see that? A response. That's good. Johnny, you don't have to raise your hand. You can just shout it out, my man. Incoming message. Right? Do any of you have iPhones in here? All right. Do any of you, like, make fun of people who don't have iPhones? <laughs> like, my bubbles are green because of you. When I see those little dots, I think of things like the other person is typing, they're thinking, maybe they're choosing their words wisely. Maybe they were going to say something and then they backed up and they were going to say something else. Um, I think this is maybe they're typing the longest message ever or maybe they should just hurry up. But at the end of the day, it's, it's an indication that they are responding, right? And that's the title of my message tonight is Respond. I want to ask you about another word. Um, when I say the word situation, what kinds of things come to your mind when I say the word situation? Bad, could be bad situation, awkward situation. What else? Hmm? Hmm? Good or bad outcome, right? So this word situation, let's look at the definition of situation. The definition of situation is this. It is the way in which something is placed in relation to its surroundings. It is a, a position in life. And I'm going to talk a little bit about situations. You know this verse. We actually um, have covered it in the past, and we're going to continue to think about it because it's, it's vital for our success. Every single word from the Word of God is so important. But John 16, 33 says, these things have I spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. Everybody say peace. peace. It says, in the world you'll have tribulation. We don't use that word a lot, but it means pressure. And then it says, be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Each and every one of us in life, we're, we're put in different situations. We're, we're kind of placed in, in different predicaments, so to speak, just through uh, the, as you go through the course of life, when you're going through your day-to-day -day responsibilities and things, you find yourself in different situations. Some of you text me, PG, I was going to be at late night, but my boss called me in. You find yourself in a situation that maybe you didn't expect to be in. In the Passion Translation, it says this way. And everything I've taught you is so that the peace which is in me will be in you and will give you great confidence as you rest in me. For in this unbelieving world, you will experience trouble and sorrows, but you, everybody say you. It says, you must be courageous, for I have conquered the world. Remember, Jesus said, it is finished. So his part is finished. I have, past tense, we talk about that, past, present, future. It's past, it's already done. Jesus said, I have conquered the world. It is finished. But it's up to us to be bold. So what does that mean? That means tonight when you face a situation, tomorrow when something comes up and you're put in a situation that you didn't expect to be in, it's up to you to be bold. It's up to you to conquer. It's up to you to overcome, even though Jesus has already overcome. Just like me, and I shared this um, with the little homies and deep on Monday night, like I had a little situation where I got into a little altercation, okay, and I like kind of got up on like the, got up on this guy's truck and I was having a conversation with him about what I would like him to do on my property and that was leave my property and then he didn't want to leave my property and so I got a little bit elevated, y'all, and I didn't, you know, it's kind of like on that threshold of strife, you know, like <laughs> maybe not totally walking in love, but I didn't foresee that situation. I didn't like have like all this preparation time where it's like, oh, I'm so peaceful today. It was like, you know, something about his response when I just asked him to park his giant semi, like not on my asphalt, you know, that we paid hundreds of thousands of dollars for. Uh, something about his response just didn't sit good with me. But I found myself in that situation, and I think at the end of the day, I feel like I took an L. You know what I'm saying? Like, that, you know, I need a redo on that. <laughs> like, that was in the L column right there. You know, I, I just... Even though it's our property, even though it's our right to say, hey, you can't turn your big giant 
18-wheeler semi all over our asphalt. You know, I just, I allowed him to kind of get under my skin, so to speak. I allowed him to kind of get the best of me. Like, I, I found myself just like, ooh, I was ready to fight. You know what I mean? I'm going to call the police. I'm going to get a restraining order on this guy. I'm going to get a criminal trespassing, which is a petty misdemeanor. You need to get over it, and then you can't come on my property anymore. Why? Because I asked you to leave, and you didn't leave. Like, literally, I could have done that. I didn't do that. I just said, God, I repent. I, I got into strife. I forgive that homie. Like literally all, I, I parked my truck in front of his semi and like he wasn't going to leave until I had words with him. Like I was upset, but I didn't foresee that situation coming. And, and I didn't do my very, very best in that situation. But the point is this, every single time you find yourself in a situation, it's up to you to respond in a godly way. It's up to you to respond in a way that's going to set you up for the win. And at the end of the day, that's what we want to do. We want to be victorious. Why? Because Jesus paid for us to be victorious. He literally made it available to us. He's already done his part. We're not waiting on him in any way. And obviously that's just a silly little example, but let's think about some things in our life. You know, all of these different situations that we face and we're thinking about how we respond. So maybe it's loss. I had a young person uh, tonight in, in youth and, and uh, he suffered a loss. One of his friends passed away. Maybe it's a, maybe you, you suffered the loss of a parent or, or a sibling or an aunt or an uncle or whatever the case may be. It's, it's your response in that time. Maybe you are experiencing a symptom in your body. And we know according to the word of God, by Jesus' stripes, we were healed. Well, how are we going to respond, right? Maybe you got dumped by your boyfriend or your girlfriend, like, you know what I mean? Like, and you just feel bad about life because you got dumped and you feel like abandoned and neglected and like unwanted. You know what I mean? Like we face situations in life. Maybe uh, your rent is due or maybe you like bought a car and you didn't really think about how much the insurance was gonna be on that car. And then it's like, you find yourself strapped for cash because you made some bad decisions. And now you're in this thing called a little bit of a situation <laughs> where, the money's gone. You know what I'm saying? All of these different things in life, these are real life scenarios that you could find yourself in. Now, some of these other ones that I want to talk to you about, they're more like feelings. I feel depressed. I feel oppressed. And here's the thing. Those feelings are just as real as those literal circumstances. You know, like I, I don't have enough money. I'm out of money or I did get dumped or I do have this symptom or somebody I love did die. Those are real literal things, but these emotional things and our feelings, the, your feelings are real. But here's the thing, how you respond to your feelings, that's where the rubber meets the road. That's where the victory is, is how you respond, whether it be a literal thing or whether it be a feeling thing. Uh, it could be a fear about your future, a worry about your, your friend or your family, your loved one, like my mom, she's crazy and she won't stop using drugs. You know, whatever the, whatever the thing is for you, what is your response? That's the difference. It could be maybe you're battling uh, confusion, you're indecisive about your future, you're questioning your decisions, and I, I just, you know, I'm doing this, and I'm, and I'm going to college, and I just don't know if it's right, you know what I'm saying? Like, all of these feelings are constantly bombarding all of us. That's a very, very real thing. But here's the thing, at the end of the day, as we grow, as we mature, we need to know, okay, I can't be moved by my feelings. Some people say, I felt like speeding, so I sped. And guess what happened? I got a ticket. You know what I mean? I felt like eating more than I should, and I did, and, and it was bad. You know what I mean? Like, we, we sometimes are moved by our feelings, but as we grow and as we mature, you say, you know what? I feel like a triple cheeseburger, but I, I think a better decision would be to eat an actual real unprocessed food. Or, you know, I feel like a large Coke right now. Can I get an amen with lots of ice, somebody? But maybe I should make a decision to say, I'm going to actually drink water because I haven't had water all week. You know what I'm saying? Like, like I'm, I'm, get, I'm like praying for the kid and he's like severely dehydrated and it's like, you know, things aren't going well because he's so dehydrated. It's like, well, you know, that's why he's in the hospital and that's why they're like, they keep hooking up the bags of the IVs to the kid and they're trying to hydrate the kid. You know what I mean? Like, we can't be moved by our feelings. Now, are, are Cokes bad in and of themselves? Everything's good in moderation. Coca-Cola, amen. Any Pepsi fans in here? My man. I'm with Dylan. I, I drink a Pepsi. I'll drink a Coke. You know what I'm saying? But, but here's the thing. It's, it's about your decision-making process. And sometimes, like just for me, like when I jumped on that guy's truck, like I was just like, I was already kind of feeling like a little bit spunky that day. You know what I mean? Like just say something. Somebody say something. Like I'm, I was kind of ready to pick a fight because I was just on edge. Like this other guy had made me mad a couple days earlier, and I just didn't like the way he talked to me. I was like, you know, that ain't, 
that ain't what's up like what you said is not true he's like well actually it's working i'm like no it's not working that's why we're having this conversation like i was already a little bit like just on edge okay let's keep moving on we don't got to talk about me let's talk about y'all here's the thing so that's uh you know we're talking about respond we're talking about situations what about when i say uh a fork in the road you know the expression you guys get that like what what do you think about when i say a fork in the road a fork in the road thank you connor you know like options yeah exactly right you got like you got some different ways you could go like there, there might be more than one option sometimes a fork in the road like a literal show me the picture of the fork in the road the, the fork in the road is like literal like you know okay do i go right or do i left but honestly i, I love that pc said options because in life you're going to have options it, you're going to come to a situation where it's like, am I going to do what I know in my heart to do? Am I going to do what I feel led by the Spirit of God to do? Or am I going to do what my parents are telling me to do? Am I going to do what all my friends are doing? Well, they're going to tech, so I'm going to tech. Okay, really? Good luck with your student loans, okay, when you drop out and you almost made it, but you didn't almost make it because you didn't. We, we knew you weren't going to make it because you didn't do your homework in high school. And I don't want you to have thousands and thousands of dollars of debt because, you know, I can see the writing on the wall. You didn't have the discipline to do what it took in high school. Like, I don't want you to have unnecessary debt. Like, let's, let's develop discipline in your life. And then if you are called to be an engineer, then go to school and be an engineer because you have to have a certificate and you have to have a license to be that. But here's the thing. A fork in the road, and, and, and the Word of God talks about this. Listen, the easy path everybody's going to take the complaining path. All your friends are going to take the complaining path. The backbiting path, all of your, the majority of your friends in the world, now that's why it's important who our friend circles are, but, but many, many people, the majority is always going to pick the path of complaining, crying, whining, negativity. Man, if people are negative, just be like, okay, listen, like I need you to change and I want to help you change, but like I'm going to have to like be around you in moderation because negativity is contagious. See, but what you want to do is the Bible says iron sharpens iron. So one person sharpens the countenance of their friend. So it's like, listen, all of us have been negative. Let's just be honest. You know, like we all thought about that other person who's negative. Like, yeah, so-and-so, they're so negative. I need to stop hanging out with them. But we've all had negative tendencies, right? Being pessimistic, expecting the worst. But as people of faith, we should expect the best. We should expect victory. But part of that, the biggest part, it has to do with our decisions. It has to do with our intake. See, it matters what you're putting in. It matters what music you're listening to. It matters what you're reading. It matters what you're putting your eyes on. Like people are fearful of the coronavirus. I'm like, that sounds like a drinking problem. Did Pastor Kathy say, did Pastor Kathy say beer virus the other day or something? She said beer virus in copy of PK. And I'm like, did she just say beer virus? <laughs> it was so awesome. But it's like, you know, if you're, if you're not feeding on those things and you're not even opening the door for fear of that, like, oh my gosh, one person in the United States died of the coronavirus. You know what I mean? And now everybody's fearful of it and everybody's shutting down all of their businesses because of one person. But here's the thing. When you come to this fork in the road, if you make this right decision, if you say, I'm not going to be a complainer, I am going to do what's right, I am to be led by the Spirit, you may find yourself with feelings of aloneness, right? You know, just like we've had as, as we have the, uh, the life internship program for, for young people when they, when they uh, graduate high school, we make it available to them. 18 to 26 year olds, we're like, hey man, if, if you want help in life, we would love to join with you. We wanna partner with you. We wanna encourage you, we wanna strengthen you. We wanna cultivate disciplines in your life and, and help you in every way we can. And so sometimes, uh, you know, I remember when we first started the program, we're like, oh, dude, we're going to have to get a bigger room. We're going to need room for all of the people that are going to want to be interns. And it was like we had a few. But here's the thing. We didn't go out of our way to convince all of these people to become interns because what happens, the way you get them is the way you keep them. Do you understand? And so as we've done that, we've seen young people make this decision, and a lot of times they're in the minority. A lot of times their friends are going and doing other things that appear to be more fruitful, that appear to have more, uh, you know, going for them and so to speak. But as they've continued and the word, they found themselves just like we did. So thankful that they obeyed God. 
And that's where you'll find yourself if you come to the fork in the road, whatever it is, doesn't matter what it is. But if you find yourself saying, God, let me just pause because I'm at a point where I need to make a decision. Just like me, I didn't pause. I just jumped on that guy's truck and started talking to him. Say, hey, man, I need you to get up off my property. But here's the thing. If you'll pause and make a quality decision, you'll absolutely not regret it. Even if you feel alone, so to speak, Jesus was the ultimate in being alone. Why? Because he was forsaken by God so that God would not have to forsake us. I want to talk, uh, uh, let me tell you what the definition is of fork on the road. It says, the fork on the road is a metaphor based on a literal expression for a deciding moment in life or history when a major choice, everybody say choice, major choice of options is required. When you're put in a situation, when life puts you in this certain position, how will you respond? What will be your choice? You guys know Deuteronomy 30, uh, verse 19 and 20. Let me read it to you from the New King James. Actually, let me, let me just tell you the definition of respond real quick. This word respond, you know, we, we talk about like, you know, like I responded aggressively you know what I mean? Like we respond, uh, but, but the word respond actually means to say something in return, to make an answer. Just like when we see that text bubble, they're getting ready to say something. So a lot of times we think about our response like, okay, we, we had this option between going to this school or going to this school or doing this or doing that, and we responded by doing this. But, but the definition of respond is to say something in return, to make an answer. So actually, we could put it this way. You know, we said earlier, when you're put in a situation in life, when you're put in these certain positions, how we respond, we could actually say it this way. When you're put in these situations in life, what will you say? See, what are you going to say when your friends are like, come on, man, just do it? Are you going to say, no, like, I'm, I'm, I don't want to do that. I'm making different decisions with my life. Do you know what I'm saying? Because it's, honestly, it's, re it's really important that you learn that now. Why? Because I literally, I came across this situation recently and I was, I was talking with my brother and I was like, man, this is like this weird thing that happened to me. And, and, and he and I were talking and he's like, yeah, you know what that's called? It's called insurance fraud. And I'm just like, it just went off inside of me. I was like, oh my goodness. And it's like these people who were involved in this situation would probably have benefited when they were your age from learning to say, no, I'm not gonna do that learning to stand up for the convictions that were on the inside of them. Why? Because they, they're putting themselves on thin ice. Y'all understand that expression? That means it's a very volatile situation. I mean, I don't know what all the repercussions are, but I'm just saying, y'all kind of like in trouble. Let me just step back and distance myself from you guys. Do you understand? So you have to learn now to say, man, I, I, I'm not moved by what my friends think. I'm not moved by what my friends say. Now, the Bible says there's, there's safety in, in uh, godly counsel, yeah. right? In wise counsel. That means you have to understand, like, okay, my friend, like, they got my back, and they're super energetic, but they're still growing in their wisdom, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to seek wise counsel over here, even though my roll dog, he's with me, he's for me. I may not get my advice from him, but, like, if I need somebody in a fight, like, he's my man. Do <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, wise counsel. The Bible says we follow those who through faith and patience, they're inheriting the promises of God. That's what I want to do. That's what Pastor Charity and I do. We're following our leaders. We're actually, we're following specifically directly our pastors and, and our pastor's company, meaning the people that they follow, the people that they receive from, the people that literally uh, are, are, are um, in their company. Exactly. And so it's like, you know what? I want to follow the company of my leaders. Because, you know, there, it's so dangerous, and I see it all the time. People are like, yeah, well, they don't like so-and-so, but so and so is really awesome, and they just don't get it. They just don't see it. And, and what it is, it's unfortunate, but the person who's actually having that conversation, they don't see it. They don't see their lack of submission to their leader. See, because God has called each and every one of us to a certain place, and it's our responsibility to submit. There's, let me break it to you, there's no perfect leader in all the world. See, but there are people that you are called to be under, and there are people who are, you are called to follow, and there's safety in that place. That's a big part of why Pastor Charity and I are as successful as we have. It's not because the leaders we followed are perfect. It's because they were called to be our leaders, and we chose to submit to that and to follow them. And we're continuing to do that. 
Literally, I had, I had a, a great phone conversation with Reverend John George, who was like my intern. Uh, you know, he, he had the internship, which Charity and I took, which we met. Amazing. Praise God for that. But like literally, I had nothing to offer. I was confused. I was insecure. I was, you name it, fill in the blank. That was me. And yet he believed in me. He saw potential in me. He gave me responsibilities. He asked me to do things that I didn't even know I could do. And I found that there's safety in following the leaders that God has put in my life. So how will you respond when you come to the fork in the road? Deuteronomy 30, 19 and 20. This is New King James. I call heaven and earth as witness today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose. Everybody say choose. Choose life that both you and your descendants may live, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice and that you may cling to him for he is your life and the length of your days and that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob to give them. We're instructed to choose life. And I want to talk to you guys about how this word respond means to say. It means to speak. I want to tell you, actually, I'm going to skip uh, Romans, and I'll just kind of tell you what it says. Like, against all odds, it says in verse 18, when it looked hopeless, Abraham believed. And it goes on, um, I think in verse 21, it says that Abraham glorified God. Do you know what that means? That means he declared with his mouth. He spoke and said, my God is faithful. He responded with words of faith in the face of of what looked impossible. So when you're facing something that looks impossible, I don't know how I'm gonna do this, I don't know how I'm gonna get my act together, I don't know how I'm ever gonna, you know, whatever. You respond in faith and you say, God is faithful and he will absolutely help me. And that's when you'll find yourself this victorious, overcoming Christian that God has absolutely called you to be. Every single person in this room, literally, I, I can almost, almost literally sense the faith in the, this spirit of victory, this spirit of faith, like I'm an overcomer. I'm an overcomer in my finances. I'm an overcomer in my health. I'm an overcomer in my purpose. I'm an overcomer in my life. I can feel it rising. You just think you, you got to literally say, I'm going to take hold of this and I'm going to do what the word tells me to do. It's up to you to choose life. Mark chapter 11, verse 22 through 24. This is really where I wanted to get. It says, so Jesus answered and said unto them, have faith in God. So Jesus, right from the very get-go, he says, let me just tell you, your faith, your trust, the word hope in the Bible is a confident expectation, not like, oh God, I hope they pick me, or God, I hope I'll get a raise. Like, that's wishing. Hope in the Bible is this confidence. And so God, uh, Jesus literally says, put your faith, your trust, your hope in God. And then verse 23, for surely I say to you, whoever says, everybody say says. Jesus said, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done. It goes on and says, he will have whatever he says. See, three times in that one verse of scripture, it talks about us saying. Three times it talks about the words that are coming out of your mouth. One time it says believe. See, a lot of, a lot of people think, I just don't, I just don't have enough faith. I just, you know, I, I just, I guess I don't believe. It's like, listen, you don't believe because you keep saying you don't believe. Start saying what the word says only and stop saying all that other crap. Stop talking about the diagnosis. Stop talking about what you don't have. Look at this. Matthew chapter 6, verse 31. Therefore, do not worry saying. The Bible says, take no thought saying. The way we take thoughts or the way, you know, taking thoughts in a negative sense or the way we worry is when we start saying with our mouth. The context of that verse is this. Therefore, do not worry saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink or what shall we wear? After all these things the Gentiles seek, the Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All those things will be added unto you. See, we know that, you know, Matthew 6, 33, sometimes when we get churchy and you've been around here long enough, you know the verse, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. It sounds so cool and so awesome until you have to actually do it and live it and make decisions based on what the word's instructed you to do. But I love that first part of the verse, take no thought saying. 
See, when you face a challenge in life, when you come to a fork in the road, when you find yourself in a situation that is not ideal, what are you saying? It's, the, it's absolutely the difference maker. Maybe you feel pathetic. Maybe you feel wimpy. Listen, I've been there. However pathetic you are in here tonight, I was more pathetic than you are. I'm not saying you are, but I'm just saying if you feel like, gosh, I'm just lousy. I'm, I'm bad at life. I'm bad at faith. I'm bad at walking by faith. God will help you. Stop saying that. Start saying what the word says. Love this, Joshua 24, 15. If it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourself this day who you're gonna serve. Whether the gods of your father served uh, on the other side of the river or the God of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. This is a decision that you make. Man, I'm gonna serve God. When church is going on, I'm gonna be in church. You know, there's people, I'm looking right now, there's people that here, were here when we started, and, and they're not here. And I, I don't think about the ones that aren't here in that context, like, oh, so-and-so wasn't there. No, I rejoice that each and every one of you are here tonight. Because you're the one who the anointed word preached, or just simply the word of God being preached and falling upon your ears. The word has a, a, an opportunity to work in your life. Why? Because you chose to be here. I love that. Proverbs 24, 16, for a righteous man falls seven times and yet he rises again, but the wicked shall fall by calamity. Isaiah 40, 31, those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. The word always has the right response. The word of God always has the right response. But listen, this is the thing. Here's the difference maker. Knowing what the word says is absolutely not enough. There's a lot of Christians who know exactly what the word says, but when that fork in the road comes, when that situation comes, their response or the words of their mouth is not what the Bible says. We've all been there. I'm working this into my life where I want to respond, meaning I want to speak. That's what we say. Uh, Pastor Charity says it this way. You don't fight, uh, you don't fight thoughts with thoughts. You fight thoughts. The, the enemy... Your adversary, like you're, 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 whether you like it or not, you're in a fight. Anybody like to fight in here? <laughs> we should all like to fight from now on because we're in a fight. The Bible says fight the good fight of faith. The Bible says your adversary, the devil. He's literally the accuser of the brethren. That means he's like, he's telling you day and night how bad you suck. He's telling you day and night how you're going to fail. In every way, you're going to fail. In all the ways, and how you're going to fail over and over and over. I love that. The Bible says, I would not have you ignorant of your enemy's devices. That means he's not going to like pull a fast one on you and like, oh, I didn't see that coming. It's like, well, if you, if you walk with God and you fellowship with God and you read his word, you won't find yourself in that place where you were ignorant of his devices. Like, I know he's trying to lie to me. So I have to fight those thoughts with my words. I have to respond. Out of the heart spring the issues of life. This is Proverbs 4, 23. It says, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. The Bible says in John 7, 38, he that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. See, when you get saved, man, just mm, your spirit is made perfect, but you got to renew your mind. Your soul needs a little bit of TLC. See, TLC is tender love and care, or like in the, in the world, we, we call it time, love, and cash, you know, when you got to fix something. But your soul, man, it needs some time, love, and cash, meaning the money of life. you got to spend some time. So uh, life and death are in the power of the tongue. That's Proverbs 18, 21. We talk about that often. We'll continue to talk about that. Death and life, actually, is how it said. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. See, this works in both contexts. When you think about the positive aspect of this, and I declare in the name of Jesus, people are texting me. Uh, let's see, 1027. We got a couple minutes. I declare all the time, my life is getting better. My finances are getting better. My health is getting better. My marriage is getting better. And I believe it. And guess what's happening? <laughs> all those things are getting better. It works. The word works. And so, but we have to continue to feed on the word out of the same spring. Listen, listen to this. James 3, 9 through 12. With it, we bless our God and Father, and with it, we curse men 
who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Thus, no spring yields both salt water and fresh. It's talking about talking out of two sides of your mouth, right? Uh, you know, and I think a lot of times it's more subtle. It's not as pathetic as I make it to be. Like, uh, but, but at the root of our foundation, we are not absolutely confident that God will supply our needs, that by his stripes we are healed, that we are more than conquerors because of Jesus. So what do you do? You feed on the word. You, feed, you put your eyes on those scriptures that say those things. Just like if I had a pitcher and I said, I'm going to pour it out, but, but I never put anything in, there would be nothing to pour out, right? But if I fill that pitcher with water, when it comes time to pour out, there's something in there to come out. That's why we feed on the word, so that when we're faced with that situation, when we come to that fork in the road, we have a response. We have a word ready to come out of our spirit. I will live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. Out of the abundance of your heart, you will speak. This is Luke 6. 45. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. We're talking about our words. We're talking about our response to every single thing that you face in life. What are you saying? Last scripture, Hebrews 10, 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. This is Bible hope, our confident expectation without wavering. It says, for he who promised is faithful. If you fill your word, fill your heart with the word, the correct response will be there. If you fill your heart with the word of God, the, the words of faith will be there. That's why we tell you guys to come to church. This doesn't happen overnight. The sign says, life takes time. We live like in an instant society where we got high speed, super duper Google fiber. You can have everything right now. We got Amazon Prime. Come on, somebody. You know what I'm saying? Do they even do like overnight? Do they still do overnight? It was like they were struggling to deliver on their promises. They're getting their drones ready where it's like when you hit the button, the drone's like hovering over your house. But here's the thing. It's going to take time to be a person of faith to be a person who walks out what Jesus exemplified for us. He literally showed us how to do this, how to walk by faith, how to declare, how to respond when something comes up. Remember Jesus, when he was tempted, he'd been in the wilderness 40 days fasting. Man, he was big hungry. You ever been big hungry before? He was big hungry, and the tempter came and tempted him. What did he say? It is written. Oh, man, I want some bread right now. He told me to turn them stones into bread. I want some bread. He didn't say that. He said, it is written. Do you know what I'm saying? Jesus responded.